Manson here with the Good Morning Portugal show from expatsportugal.com. How are you today? Do let me know how you're doing. I mean, I'm looking out of the window here in central Portugal, the well-pruned vineyard. Actually, it's moved on since the well-pruning moment, a uh, well-pruned moment. It is, it, it's burgeoning. The, um, the vineyard is looking great. The new growth is there for the spring and therefore wine it is evocative of the wine of the wine that will be produced later um, in in the the months and years to come. It's a beautiful scene out there here in Portugal. Beautiful sunny day. I hear uh, in my native uh, UK there may be um, sleet and snow and that sort of thing, which um, it's hard to believe looking out of my window here. I'm not gloating. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying. Um, let me know if I mean there are people who are tuned in from what um, Belgium, uh, Australia, Singapore. Uh, Norway, Finland this morning. Let us know how your weather is. Uh, I'm British. We start with the weather. but th And we tend to avoid politics, don't we? Stick to the weather. It's a bit easier. Not that there aren't disagreements about the weather. But politics and religion are the subjects that people tend to stay, steer clear of. Not us here on the Good Morning Portugal show. We have a wonderful guest with us this morning. Bring him on in just a moment after a few of your greetings are shared on the screen. Got the wonderful M Miguel Silva, who saw what we're up to here on this show and uh, rose to the call to talk to us about Portuguese politics. I claim to have a, a Portuguese political age, mental age of about five, I think, certainly under 10 still uh, in my understanding and grasp of Portuguese politics. He's here. He knows about these things and he's going to tell us all about it. Before we go to Miguel, who's limbering up in our, our green room, uh, let's talk to Paul Richards. Greetings from Harrogate. Minus two this morning in Yorkshire. Brrr. Uh, lots of sunshine. It's like Portugal, but without the heat. Yeah. Portugal without the heat is not Portugal, right? Uh, bon dia alegria from snowy Maastricht. Um, Maastricht, um, treaties thereof, and Belgium um, and the EU might come in. Brussels might come in to our conversation this morning, of course. Magdalena, uh, Hans Ma is there. Marcus Valbon saying good morning to us this morning. And Mark Rigby up in the north. Mark knows a thing or two about politics. I think you'll find this interesting this morning, Mark. Uh, bon dia from a sunny pavor de Vajim from you. Uh, good to have your company. Paul and Louise in the UK. Hola, bon dia, alegria. Of course, the lady who gave us that phrase, Philomena, is here. Philomena, Friday, this coming Friday. Good day, Carl, and all from Australia, from Mark and Jersey. Hello, Mark. Uh, Jersey's in the United States. Hola, bon dia. Uh, yes, trigger word warning for Americans this morning. We will be using the word communism and communist. So easy. Um, we're going to put it in a European context, so don't worry. Um, it's a misty morning here on the Silver Coast from Louise. Good morning, Louise. How are you? Sean G, 1.5 degrees in Cheshire this morning with frost on the car. Amazing. Uh, Lisa Jennings, bright and sunny in Jakarta. Listener in Jakarta in the, in the form of Lisa there. Oh, yeah, Jakarta. Wonderful. Uh, oh, no, politics. I may turn back round and leave. No, no, don't go anywhere. This will be interesting. It's Portuguese politics. Bon dia, Torres. will be sunny and 80. Wow, here in Atlanta today. Uh, looking forward to learning about Portuguese politics. Me too. I've already had, already had a fantastic discussion um, with Miguel before we came on air. Bon dia. Just discovered this channel. Some great advice on here, says John Rooney. I used to love watching you on Saturday Swap Shop when I was younger. Very funny, John. <laughs> Bon dia all. <laughs> we are barely seeing. I need a, a woolly on. It's too hot for a Noel Edmonds star woolly, isn't it? Uh, seeing through the raindrops from uh, Donna. Wow, Donna, rain where you are. Good morning, everyone from Gemini. And finally, for now, Edmundo. When are we going to talk to you, Edmundo? Bon dia from Villamora. Maybe later on in the show today, if we can get that figured out. But for today, this morning, introduction to Portuguese politics from Miguel Silva. Good morning to you, Miguel. How are you? Good morning, Carl. I'm very good. On this sunshiny day. It is beautiful. Where are you? Which which part of Portugal are you in? Oh, I'm just in Lisbon. Just in Lisbon. You can't say that. Lisbon, the, the great cultural, one of the great cultural capitals. Yes, of... but everyone knows Lisbon. It'd be far more exotic if I were in the countryside like you. 
Yes, fair play, fair play. Do you have a country residence as well, as most Portuguese people do? Um, I'm proud to say that I'm not from Lisbon. Um, I was born. <laughs> I was born in Coimbra. Yes, I'm sure you know. And I was raised in Braganza, which is in the northeast. Oh, town. wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So you're you. What I guess we should whisper this, but you're from real Portugal, right? Uh, what the Portuguese would say, deep Portugal. Okay, okay, that's that's nicely put. Deep Portugal, what beautiful places! And I guess if you if you are you know if you have Coimbrian and uh, Bragancian Braganzanese uh, connection, you would you would soon distance yourself from Lisbon. It's funny like that. Uh, so I've noticed so far. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, responding to that call. Um, we don't we don't know about Portuguese politics as well as we might. I think a lot of it is a lot of the nuance of it. It depends on how well you speak Portuguese uh, when, you know, when, you, when you're watching these things and growing up steeped in it. If I'm on a bus, for example, in London, I can hear what everybody's saying. I can hear them complaining about politics. If I'm on a bus in Lisbon, I don't really know what's going on. People mm. are speaking so, so you know, colloquial, everyday Portuguese very quickly, and I can't pick up on all those nuances. It's not that much better when I'm watching TV. So thank goodness you're here to break it down for us. So where do we begin in our understanding, the beginner's guide, you know, the the, the, the children's guide almost to Portuguese politics? Where would we begin, at the top or the bottom? Um, I thought I'd share a small graphic that shows, shows the uh, semi-presidential system. Great. Let's see if I can manage this uh, share button. Well, you're a brave um, man. Many people come <laughs> and, and, and share, but but uh, take your time, do what you have to do, and I'll 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 speak to a few other people while you're doing that. So no pressure there. Uh, Alô a todos e bom dia, alegria de laria, um, from Andy the Doc Thompson, who's going to Coimbra, I think, at some point today, in fact. Um, and I yes, I can add your graphics there. Perfect. Um, it's yeah. yes, how amazing. It's how very thorough of you as well. I made an effort. Yes, indeed. So, yeah. <clears throat> so it's a semi-presidential system, and it's important to understand this for those especially who come from America or, well, presidential systems, which means that, um, in short, uh, the prime minister controls the government and the executive, but the president is the head of state, which means that um, many of the laws have to go through him. He has to approve them. And he is also the supreme commander of the armed forces, the military. Mm -hmm. You have the, uh, I'm afraid it's in Portuguese. I could not find um, anything in English, but um, you see there, the head of state, uh, he is elected directly, whereas the government uh, is basically people vote for a party. They don't vote for the name of a person. And it's then that party that chooses whoever becomes prime minister, minister, the MPs uh, in parliament, uh, et cetera. But it, it, it would be a parliamentary system entirely were it not for the head of state being given uh, sort of a supervisory role in, in the system. Fascinating. Okay. And, 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 and uh, is it all right for me to interrupt you and ask you questions as we go? Or of did course. You... Please okay. do. And, and what are the origins and, and when did this formally begin, uh, this particular style of system that we have here now today? <clears throat> well, um, back in the First Republic, so after 1910, uh, monarchy ends, the uh, Republic is introduced. Uh, the problem was that in the early years of the Republic, the presidents had um, sometimes disproportionate amount of power. The system was very unstable uh, at first. Yeah. And so eventually, uh, this sort of system was agreed upon. Now, during the dictatorship, this was the system, except that it was only formally the system. Informally, of course, Salazar, even though he was prime minister, he had all the power, he had absolute power. But even during dictatorship times, formally, the president did have some powers, although he wouldn't exercise them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we're talking about a fairly recent um, development. It, I, I would say it's been working like this in a stable uh, fashion since the revolution. Yes. Amazing. Since Amazing. 74. Yep. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So sure. Oh, I've lost your presentation now. Is that, is that the only uh, one you want to share with us? Uh, 
plenty of things. Uh, actually, I mean, I, I've heard a few things, but let me. Uh, <laughs> But I will. Uh, I will do, give a few more. It's mostly history, and then you know, as people begin to ask questions, I'll just. Yes, through. of course. Um, uh, there is one question already in, um, and I will um, keep us up to date with the greetings that are coming in as well. Uh, Paul, hola, bon dia from a lovely Cabanas de Tavira today. Can I ask about the history of the left block, and is it a pattern for others to follow? I mean, you don't have to answer that straight away, but if we can factor that in at some point, that'd be great. Um, Andrea and Omar are here. Hello, good morning to everyone. This is a very interesting topic. So there's certainly an appetite um, for what we're talking about this morning and, and uh, for a deeper understanding of what's going on politically in Portugal. Bon dia, Alegria from a sunny Brixham in the UK. Um, and um, Andy, looking for the dubious pleasure of being the most political person here, except perhaps uh, our guest. Um, so we'll give that award to you for the time being, for sure, Doc. Um, and his favourite phrase, uh, Miguel, if you, I don't know if you agree with this, um, is if you don't do politics, politics will do you. Uh, hence, mm. the, hence the importance of understanding of what's going on politically. Um, well, there's certainly a lot of truth to that, yes. <laughs> okay, so um, we, we, we have this, uh, we, we've got the broadest picture here, and, and those, are the, those are the characters we're familiar with, I think, as, as expats, tourists, and, and foreigners. You know, we know um, Marcelo, as he's affectionately known, sometimes not affectionately known, but we know the president, and we know Antonio Costa, the, the leader, and they have been the, um, I suppose, the dynamic duo of, of the recent uh, pandemic times, um, offering leadership through this. And, and I thought to have been done a fairly good job. Obviously, in the world of politics, you're never free of criticism. But in, in terms of the, the world picture, they've done a fairly good job with pressures from the population, with pressures from Brussels, and whoever else you know the pressure comes from politically. Um, are you going to tell us as well about the, the broader picture of the political parties this morning? Because I think that's what left block has been mentioned there that's that's the that's the fascination i have and the bit i struggle to understand you know how, how how we're broken up into political parties and what the political chamber is like in portugal um well the political chamber is easy enough it, there's only one of them uh, we don't have a senate um so it's it's fairly straightforward people vote the vote is more or less proportional um uh, in attributing uh, mandates and then um because there's only one parliament, the parliament, basically whoever controls most seats in parliament controls the government, gets to uh, form um, a government. Uh, I will share with you the result of the first election in Portugal. Okay. Uh, first ever? Yes. Uh, for after the after the revolution. Then. Okay, so we're talking, yeah, we've got a, a sort of post-revolutionary context here. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, so the... Yeah. Very quick question before we move on from from, from the, um, the 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 early days here. Um, but uh, Merrill and John Smith are saying I, I'm really interested in this. Uh, was Salazar technically the prime minister then? Because I mean he's he's characterised uh, in historical terms culturally as the dictator, but also prime minister. That was his actual position was prime minister. Yes, he okay. started out as he was invited. The, uh, there was a, a military coup that overthrew the uh, civilian uh, power. So the military took, took power. Um, they invited relatively early on Salazar to be the finance minister. Uh, he, his expertise was he had studied law in Coimbra. He was a brilliant student, but I think he specialized in um, financial law, something like that. And so he was invited to be the finance minister. Um, he was not given enough power to um, basically turn the economy around, so he quit. And then he, he returned uh, again through the invitation of the military to become uh, the finance minister. Then he would very quickly rise to the head of government. At the time, it was called president of the Council of Ministers. He was prime minister, effectively. Uh, and he would rule as prime minister for the remainder of his uh, tenure, even though, of course, elections from then on were not particularly Yes. Well, OK. And it's it, it's it's kind of hard to get your head around that, isn't it? And for that to be a phenomenon in such recent times in history as well. But I guess that takes us a little bit away from our, our subject uh, for the time being, although, you know, people uh, may wish to return to the fascination about Salazar. So I've, I've lost your um, screen share again there. Uh, you, you were showing us a, a political, the, uh, political pie chart. Again. 
Yeah, go for it. Uh, bon dia, Carl. We're having our fifth barbecue of the year this evening. Typical Brits. Uh, five days of good weather and then obviously five barbecues in a row. Loving this weather. Loving this country. Good topic also, by the way. So here we go. Here's the, the makeup of the first election. So this election took place um, in 76. In 74 was the revolution that overthrew uh, the, uh, the dictatorial regime. In 75, we had what we call the hot summer because uh, tensions were high and we were on the verge of a civil war. And then finally, everyone agreed um, at the end of the year to um, uh, forego any military options and go straight to uh, the elections. And so in 76, this was the, the result. Could you lift that off the page for us and tell us who the colours are for those who might not be able to zoom in that closely? Um, oh, excellent. Well, you've done it. Yeah. Right. Been... Good. So uh, it's actually interesting to see this because the system remained roughly the same for the next, oh, 30 years. It didn't change much. Um, so the the one of the problems with the hot summer of 75 was that the communists had been the only organized party during dictatorship years. They were a clandestine party, but they were organized. They had people everywhere. And then the remainder of the political system uh, was either exiled or they were part of the system, but they didn't really have much power. So um, you see here uh, the orange PPD or the blue CDS. They were people who came from, say, a Christian democratic uh, background. Oh. And during the dictatorship, they were in parliament, but there was only one party in parliament, and they were they formed what was known as the liberal wing of uh, that parliament or that party, because they advocated for actual democracy. The others, uh, many people, the, the leader of PS, the Socialist Party, he was in exile, and the communists had been the only organized party. So in '75 they wielded um, a disproportional amount of power and influence, comparing to how many people actually wanted them to form government. And that was the source of the tensions uh, because the communists were not that eager to have elections and the socialists and everyone else were because they knew they would get uh, yes. more votes. Yes. And, and this, th this is the beginning of, of the, of what we understand today as the, as the party. So could you, could you break down those acronyms for us? That would be really helpful. Sure. And then if, if we might, I mean, the country looks so, sort of politically set doesn't it when you look at the, the picture on the right you get to see where the strongholds are of the of, of these political convictions and beliefs but yes please do tell us what so udp pcp ps ppd and cds what do they stand for and could you sort of elaborate a little bit more on on their values of course so let's start on the left pcp is very easy it's the portuguese communist party uh the acronym works in english as well um uh, they were a communist party. They were of the Marxist-Leninist uh, school, yeah. and they still are. Um, <laughs> you hasten to add, yes. On the left of the PCP were, was UDP. Um, UDP were far left, um, but they were not... You see, even in the 70s, there were some, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, dissension... Uh, by you know, uh, relatively to the Soviet Union. So the PCP would pretty much do whatever Moscow would tell them to do. Uh, but there were many Marxists that were not aligned with, with the Soviet Union. And um, there were many different, uh, there were dozens of parties in, in 76, but the UDP was the only far left party other than the communists to uh, manage to, to get elected. And the people who were part of UDP would later uh, uh, form the left bloc. So there, there has always been a, a far left um, um, Trotskyite, non-Leninist uh, non version of, of communists on, in, in parliament. Uh, well, wow. uh, uh, greater or lesser degree. Yes, like in UDP is what well, ultra direito portuguesa or something along those lines? <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. No, the Portuguese Democratic Union, but oh, uh, all, you did say the well, big one, yeah. Okay. Anyway, all, many of these names are um, euphemistic, so uh, you know, I don't think that UDP at the time was particularly democratic, but uh, well, <laughs> um, okay. there they were. And the biggest party there, and 
consistently throughout um, the, this regime, uh, the Third Republic, uh, has been PS, which is a socialist party. Um, they're pink because their symbol was for a long time the rose. Uh, it's either the fist, the socialist fist, or the rose, and so the, their color has well, been seen as this pink. Mm -hmm. um, their leader came from uh, the exile. He was a lawyer who used to defend um, people who were persecuted by by the dictatorship. Uh, he was then, you know, um, with political tensions, he was forced to flee. But he um, founded the Socialist Party in Germany in exile. And when he came back, he brought with him many of the people, many of the structures that he had formed abroad. Um, and so it was relatively easy for PS to uh, not only uh, run for election, but win the election. Wow. Thank you. Uh, to, yeah. Sorry, to, the right of, to the right of PS, you have PPD. Um, um, the People's Democratic Party. It was. It would later change the name to PSD, which you do know today. Yeah. Um, so they're still there. There the, the, in Portugal, they were called at the time centre right, along with CDS. But of course, e even supposedly right wing parties had to be socialist in some fashion. Otherwise, they were fascists. You, know, you were either socialist or fascist after the revolution. Um, People did not have much tolerance for anything even remotely resembling Salazar. And so PSD is, is the Social Democratic Party, um, and CDS is the Democratic Social Center. So they all have to be social in some form in order to exist. But, um, but they are, in the Portuguese context, what is considered to be the, the right wing. Yes, yes. Uh, what an amazing time <clears throat> of history and to be alive in, in Portugal. Um, Edmundo saying here, our taxi man, Edmundo, um, and, and I, I think you can always get forthright political views from, from a taxi, taxi driver. <laughs> uh, after 1976, creation of political parties ensured all citizens uh, a social protection, ensuring the Portuguese with social, educational and uh, health security. So uh, that to me sounds like a, a, a valid and, and appropriate um, analysis of what went on there moving from dictatorship into a bright new future uh, for Portugal that's that's how I, I would imagine it was was it actually like that or was there still this you know this great sense of heat both um, in, in terms of the weather and in terms of the political temperature um, yes well tensions uh, decreased um, even though throughout the 80s uh, there were still tensions and there was a terrorist an active terrorist group in Portugal um, known as FP25. Uh, the protection forces of the 25th of April revolution, and they uh, they killed a few people, um, even um, even back then. Um, but there was no more danger of civil war, which was the most important thing. Um, as for the uh, social reforms, yes, um, one cannot say that the social security and healthcare systems began with the Third Republic, but. Um, the, the Third Republic greatly expanded them um, relatively to the to the dictatorship. Of course, many of the um, the most important schools, universities, and hospitals were built during the dictatorship. So it's well, it, it's a system that has been progressing over the years. Interesting, interesting. And and um, we've not heard anything about the monarchy that uh, had uh, been, uh, I suppose, to. Uh, vanquished or, or or washed away some what 70 years before that time but some of the some of the countries in europe are monarchies and the difference uh between um them as i th i think yeah i remember just making the point about monarchies there was there any was there any wish for some to to bring back a monarchy or was that seen as too too much of a sort of a single party mentality or a direct a leadership that was wasn't wanted at the time and a, a, a much more social basis was required you mean after the revolution? Yeah, I mean, you know, because it's fascinating to hear of these leaders in exile. And I was going to ask you, you know, where, where where were they? Which countries were they in? Which countries were supporting them to come back to Portugal with their eye on Portugal? You know, as as a as a neighbour or as a, as a fellow European country. You said um, one leader was in Germany, presumably being helped by all sorts of other states. Was it was there a monarchy? party or was there a were there the descendants of the king from from earlier in the century waiting to come back into the scene or was that just totally out of fashion by that point no 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 um no not 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 really the monarchy was uh, overthrown in 1910 
and um, in nine, even even before that, the king and the prince heir had been murdered. Um, so the country was very uh, heavily Republican, but most importantly, the armed forces were very Republican. Um, so even during the dictatorship times, you you'd think, um, you know, naturally dictators are not particularly fond of having um, a permanent parallel power to their own, even if it were to be formal and and you know a figurehead. Mm -hmm. So already Salazar would not be particularly inclined to have uh, to have the king come back, even though he was very close to some members of the uh, of the royal family. Wow. But on top of that, the armed forces were republicans, so there was really no question of ever bringing back um, the king. What Salazar did do, he allowed the family to come back. He, they were returned uh, some of their uh, properties. Um, they were allowed to bury uh, the kings that had died and the family members that had died uh, in exile uh, because the First Republic was very, it was quite authoritarian at times and they were very persecutorial of the monarchy and of monarchists. Uh, so Salazar relaxed all of that, uh, normalized relations. Um, but look, the, the the revolution seventy four was very much Marxist inspired. Um, so any anything pertaining to conservatism, monarchy, right wing was very much um, out of the question. Now there was a small party that was founded after the revolution. Um, called the People's uh, Monarchist Party, and they're still around. Okay. Um, they have, in a few municipalities, uh, some councilmen, um, but they've only very, very intermittently had MPs, one or two every now and then, but they're, they're not a major political force. Fascinating, and what an incredible move from Salazar. So what was, do you think, the political motivation for making those terms with, with the members of the royal family? Was that a sort of populist move, or, or did he have a sort of kind, was that a cynical, or did he have a kind of side of any kind? Um, no, I, I just think that um, he came from, uh, you know, a conservative, traditionalist, right-wing um, um, intellectual milieu, and so the monarchists were very influential there. Uh, and he was a, a nationalist and a patriot, and I think he saw the royal family as, uh, you know, completely part of Portuguese history. Uh, mm. It wouldn't make much sense that if he were praising Portuguese history, the Portuguese empire, that he would be dismissive of the monarchy. Yeah, so it's not a revisi revisionist or anything like that. Not he was he was able to embrace the past, but see the world in a, in his own way. He, in, he was he was a pragmatist. He was a ruthless pragmatist, like all dictators are. Yes, yes, and um, I mean the thing that I that I think I know about him was the smart move made in the Second World War, the positioning of Portugal. I mean, would you say that was one of his sort of defining um, moves, or or how he's remembered that to take that very 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 what looks to me like a very smart position, you know, to be to be trading with everybody on based on Portugal's na natural wealth um, and, and raw materials. And and only doing deals in gold and boosting up um, Portugal's gold reserve throughout the throughout the Second World War and hosting people in a neutral way, brokering deals. Um, is that is, is that a, a correct understanding I've got there of, of how Portugal operated in the Second World War? Well, it depends on the eye of, of the beholder. Of course, I'm sure there are people in Portugal who would have preferred the country yeah. to have fought with with the Allies. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I think he was quite astute. Um, he uh, came to an understanding with Franco in Spain um, to exercise what what became known as um, um, by collaborative um, non-alignment. So, yeah. in other words. He would cooperate with the Allies, Franco would cooperate with the Axis, and their common goal was to keep the war outside of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and they were very successful in doing that. I think it was a, a, a smart choice um, because um, neither Portugal nor Spain were anywhere near prepared to, to fight a war, especially a modern war. Mm. I mean, if, you think that, if you think that Poland went down quickly, you should have seen, you know, you, you could have imagined Portugal and Spain. Spain was still reeling from the Civil War. Portugal um, was poor, you know, in spite of the colonies, it was very poor, so it didn't have a particularly relevant military uh, apparatus. 
Um, so they did what, what was possible to do diplomatically. I think that was the, the only way to, to go, really. And almost make a virtue of it. Incredible. Absolutely amazing. So we will do a little bit more sort of constitutional stuff, and then we will go to the inevitable uh, cynicism that the public have. And there are some spicy questions about how politicians are viewed. And I know we, you know, we had a little bit of conversation before we came on air about the how critical um, Portuguese people, openly critical people, Portuguese people are about politics, cynical, sometimes browbeaten, you might say. But we'll come to that sort of more social aspect of it um, in a little while. Um, Andy... Yes, he probably is the most political person here, apart from yourself. Um, and um, he made a good, po or he asked a little question that I want to come back to um, about uh, the constitution here. It, it is uh, tr uh, technically, uh, here we go. Here, Portugal is still con constitutionally a socialist state, I believe. Is that correct? Um, no. Um, what the constitution does say is that fascist parties are banned. Um, and so many people call Portugal socialist for that reason, because they've, uh. They've banned fascism, but not communism or socialism or anything like that. Um, but it, it, it's not formally a socialist state. It, it's socialist in the sense that it has a social security system, but uh, it's not a socialist by ideology, um, even though well, I would agree that it is, but, but not constitutionally. Excellent. OK. And the other part of this, of course, which we haven't mentioned in terms of how laws are created in a country and how that works alongside the political chamber. Uh, Victoria from Atlanta, Georgia, is asking and saying to you, hi, Miguel, what is the process for law creation? And I notice as well, many politicians in Portugal seem to come from the, the, the law industry, if I might call it that, or, or law. Oh, yes. Yes. They're usually lawyers. Um, uh, Plenty of engineers as well, but mostly lawyers, they, they tend to be. Um, well, listen, it's a parliamentary system. So uh, MPs, uh, political parties, they have the uh, um, initiative power when it comes to um, passing laws, proposing laws. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, I would say, though, at this point, to be perfectly frank, um, <laughs> the most important laws come from the government, government decrees. Um, are the ones that that are that are the most relevant, uh, even if they have to be approved by the president, uh, depending on the uh, the subject matter. But um, um, I, you know, the parliament takes um, forever to dis debate laws, discuss laws, and approve laws. The government just does it, um, and the executive power is very strong. It's a very centralized country politically. Okay, and 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 the, it's certainly we, <clears throat> we've seen this, haven't we, in the last year where law has been um, created very quickly, and, and if not law, then sort of, you know, state of emergency directives. And yes. it, would, it would appear that that has to be run past the president for his rubber stamping and approval. How, how real and true is that? Or is it more of a saber rattling and kind of bureaucratic thing where he just needs to, you know, offer his view? Does, does he have a lot of executive power to overturn these things? Oh, he does. Oh, okay. But um, this particular president is not particularly keen to exercise that power. And why would that be? That's his platform. That, that's his choice. He's not a combative president. We've had combative presidents. Um, the one that I showed you, the one that won the first uh, election, 76, he, he became prime minister. Later on, he became president. And then he, th th we had a, a time in the 90s where, where we had a PSD government and a PS president, and he was very combative. Um, another instance um, notorious of presidential power being uh, exercised was the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Uh, Portugal had a PSD CDS coalition government, so a right wing uh, government, and they were keen to collaborate with the Americans and send troops to Iraq. President was socialist and said no. So no troops were sent to Iraq, um, and that was that. Amazing. Okay, so that is possible. That's fascinating because the um, you know, and only being here for for, for uh, three years, you know, I've only seen um, Marcelo's tenure and 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 kind of you know uh, extended that to how all presidents might operate. But it's very interesting to hear that the president can get stuck in if they wish to uh, and overturn things. And that sounds like a really healthy and good dynamic to have um, in 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 a country's politics. Or, or, or does it make it more messy um, and difficult? Well, it, it depends. Um, it depends. I, I would say it's been working relatively well since the, the, the revolution. Um, at least 
let's put it this way, <laughs> um, apart from the dictatorship, this is the most stable uh, regime that Portugal has seen in decades, in, in centuries. So um, yeah. you, you don't have revolutions or overthrows of governments, you know, on and off. So it, it's a relatively stable system, seems to work relatively well. Um, but of course, it depends a great deal on the personalities of the people involved. Yes, but, yes, uh, and, the, and there's and a certain world, balance of power. Yes, and and world events, of course, and and the and the, and the general global context, and I, we'll, I'm sure we will come to that to talk about the influence of of um, the EU and and the European Union and and European politics on how Portugal performs as well. So I, I, you've given us a fantastic introduction there. I think we we're, we're better off in knowing who the parties are. Do keep your questions coming in here um, to Miguel Silva, who's very kindly joined us to do a, a, a Portuguese politics for beginners show this morning. Uh, long overdue. Uh, we we should as as people coming or interested in living in this country. I think you sh we should know this stuff. Uh, Victoria says, who are the players and how do they work? So we've done that or, or not work together. So, and, and I think we've given that a pretty good analysis. You know, it's, a, it's been a, a stable uh, picture since, since the, um, the election that you, that you shared with us there. Um, is there any more to say on that though, in, in terms of longstanding bitterness between parties or, or, or is it, have we said enough on that? It works fairly well, as good as politics might work in any country. Well, I was waiting for us to discuss the current situation because things of course changed a great deal in the past few years. Um, and, and that's where I would, I, I suppose, seize the, the, the opportunity to explain, um, the different rivalries and um, alliances or, well, rivalries. Perfect, so please. It's up to yeah. You. Yeah, absolutely, let's do that. Okay. So I would say the, the, the system that I was showing you worked relatively well up until the past decade. Mm. Past decade, things started to spin a little bit out of control. <laughs> um, so let's see. We are getting greetings from Germany where it's snowing, where one of our exile politicians was, as we can, as uh, Miguel told us earlier on this morning. So, yes, a good morning to you, Jim McDonald, over there. Um, a, a fist for the Blocco um, already this morning, uh, which is interesting. Bon dia from uh, Sue Hayward this morning. Um, and yeah, we'll come to this, Paul. All politicians from all countries only lie uh, when they open their mouth. So, yeah, we'll come to the more sort of. Um, <laughs> street level stuff or the pub talk in just a moment but yes okay so who do we have here Miguel? um this is uh it, it, this is uh, the leaders of psd and ps in uh 2009 okay um so i would say you know things were relatively stable uh let, let me just go back uh to the previous um, so, so these are um my previous one this is a system as it existed up until the 2000s. Um, normally, the PPD or PSD would uh, coalesce with CDS when it, when it needed uh, additional MPs to form a government. Um, or the alternative was PS ruling alone. Um, so it, it alternated between these two solutions, basically. Uh, there was a tacit understanding that the far left, the communists and the Trotskyists, would never be allowed to rule because they were too extreme. But all that ended um, in, in the past decade. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say this is important, an important year, 2009, because for the first time, you had a true ideological divide between PS and PSD. So the man on the left is the former prime minister, Socrates. Uh, he was the socialist prime minister, and on the right was his challenger, uh, a woman, a former finance minister, uh, then leader of PSD called Freda Leit. Um, and she was pro-austerity, he was against austerity, and in 2009, after uh, Socrates' first term, uh, he run, won re-election, he, um, he was given uh, another term. And that's when uh, the crisis hit, so in 2009, 2010. And his solution was what he designated as neo-Keynesian economics. In other words, now that the country is in crisis, we as government have to spend money 
so as to revive the economy. But of course, all that did was to um, um, explode the, the public debt and eventually um, leading to bankruptcy um, and, um, and to the intervention of, uh, of the Troika, of the IMF, the, the EU, the, the European Central Bank. Um, this is, I, would, I would say this was a defining moment because after that, um, tensions became very, very alive again after decades of, let's say, stability. Mm. So um, we see here the results in, um, in, in the next election, 2011, uh, PSD and CDS uh, together won, but they had a relative majority. They didn't have an absolute majority. And that was how the system worked. Um, the, the socialists would not overthrow the government, uh, would not bring down the government, uh, if, because they would recognize that they had, um, um, you know, didn't have enough MPs. Mm. And that would have been the case again in 2015, except that the now Prime Minister Koshta decided that he would uh, basically ally himself with the far left to bring down the PSD CDS uh, government, and therefore um, he he broke tradition. He he stopped the tradition that we had of um, of um, allowing governments to rule with a relative majority, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what so what were the implications of that on going from there? Well, the, the, this this uh, Socrates uh, prime minister was very, very, very divisive. Um, not only because he bankrupted the country, but because he exercised power very, very. Um, in, in, I, I don't want to say authoritarian way, but he was very um, vertical in the way he exercised power. The current president at the time was the most famous, most influential political pundit, and he had to move. From one television channel to another, because uh, his his comments, his analysis, was heavily criticized by the government, and, he, and the, the the TV channel was pressured into firing him, facilitating a, a change. So he was he was very uh, centralizing in the way he exercised power, Socrates. Uh, so the the right was was uh, enraged at him because he had bankrupt the country, because he had gone he had tried to control the media. Um, and on top of all of this, uh, shortly after he lost the elections in 2011, he was also arrested on corruption charges because apparently there were millions of euros passing through his bank accounts, when, whereas he's obviously not a rich man. Um, uh, so f because of all of this, the, ri the right-wing parties and the right-wing uh, voters, they, they couldn't stand the socialists. The socialists... Uh, I, I think should be blamed because they never did um, a mea culpa. They they never um, distanced themselves from from Socrates. Um, and then uh, w the problem was that the left as well felt very um, offended, let's put it that way, by the austerity years, yes. because even though Portugal had had economic crisis before, um, the two thousand seven two thousand nine Great Recession was worse. And they were incensed that how, how could the government even dare make cuts or, or freeze, uh, you know, careers in the in the civil in the civil servant sector, in the public sector? It, it was it was outrageous for them. Um, so that's where I where I think things started to go a bit off the rails. Um, so for that reason, there was this strong uh, incentives, strong zeitgeist for the left to be united, even though. Technically speaking, PS had a lot more in common with PSD than it, they did with the left bloc. Um, but the result was that in 2015, the, the CDS-PSD coalition won the elections. They were the most voted political force. But Kosha just went to the left bloc and the communists, and uh, they had a parliamentary agreement. And basically, the far left votes in favor of socialist budgets and they vote against uh right-wing budgets and that's how the socialists remain in power and that was an upset at that time and has been continued to be the way forward politically in this country it is what is internationally known as the contraption um we in, in portugal have a more difficult word for it but it, it means contraption it means that no no one ever expected it to last very long precisely because 
the Socialist Party and the far left didn't have, at the time at least, very much in common. Um, but apparently they, they, they do, and they still do today. Amazing. And uh, yes, and, and presumably they just become more and more comfortable bedfellows because they enjoy political power and they're able to see through their political aims. Yes, and I think that the problem with PS is that the PS went through a bit of a crisis, it's like most socialist parties did after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, because suddenly socialism was, uh, I mean, Amer in America it was always not, not very popular, but in Europe it was quite popular, social democracy was very popular. But when socialism yeah. collapsed in, in the Soviet bloc, um, at least economically, the debate was lost for the socialists. Yeah. And so over the years, the way that they've survived is through I would say just basically populism, you know, uh, trying to gather votes through campaign promises, like uh, most politicians do. But the, in terms of, in, in symbolic ideological terms, they would borrow a number of um, causes from the far left, from the left bloc. So gay marriage and uh, euthanasia and uh, abortion rights and that sort of thing. Um, not those things, you know, change things in the country a great deal, but they're symbolic. And so they would yeah. borrow those from the far left. So obviously at this point in time, the truth is um, there, there's a, there, there aren't that many differences between PS and, and the left bloc. Uh, what I think surprised the right was that the left bloc would be willing to support a government that was part of NATO, who participated in NATO missions, um, who uh, maintained the euro, who still maintains austerity, even though you know they were elected to end austerity, austerity is still there, and, uh, perhaps not for the civil servants, but certainly for the rest of the country. Taxes have not come down. I mean, you know, the, the restrictive measures are still there. Um, but uh, I suppose it's all about the narrative. It is all about the narrative. This is what we know now, isn't it? And this is a familiar picture. So there's a progressive, a, a, a sense of a progressive alliance moving the, the country forward in one sense with, with 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 issues and political ideas that you would want to be associated with as a modern country so that's one driving force in politics isn't it then there is this undercurrent of bitterness about austerity and the crash uh, the well the, the i don't think we that the country really recovered from um and then that's gone into the pandemic to make it even worse and i don't think we've really seen the full well we obviously we're not there yet but we're not aware i think of of the of the of what's coming in terms of you know adding insult to injury from austerity into an economic crisis caused by the pandemic um so then you have uh, portugal on the one hand being a poster boy and current chair i think of the european commission at the moment, uh, or EU, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, familiar with which uh, organisation Portugal is chair of, but it, it enjoys, as far as I can see, a kind of poster boy image of, of what the European ideals are about. And as long as you are a poster boy in Europe and you're doing the right thing, you are going to receive your funding and support from the EU. So th <laughs> there's those three things. And then, of course, like everywhere else, there's also the rise of popularism, uh, populism uh, in politics um, and polarization in politics. You know, all, the issues are no longer nuanced. It's like, are you with us? Are you against us? Are you red or are you blue? And everything ends up as 52 or 48 percent. Is that an accurate analysis of taking on board what you said and what my understanding is? Is that where we are right now? Or have I missed something from that picture? Um, the thing about peripheral countries like Portugal is that everything arrives late here, but uh, we still, I think, do not escape the the larger trends. And certainly, when it comes to the realignment of the political spectrum in the West, um, it's coming to Portugal as well. Um, perhaps I can share uh, some more interesting. Yeah, sure. Uh, bring that to the screen, then, Miguel, and I'll just catch us up with a few comments. Um, we we've got a fantastic crowd in this morning, an erudite and learned crowd who are telling us things like. Uh, Duarte Pio is the leader of the once royal family and was married in Portugal in 1995. So there's an amazing sort of historical tolerance of the royal family, it would appear. Um, a re-World War II and Portugal's role recommend the novel by Robert Wilson, A Small Death in Lisbon. That sounds uh, that like that should be on the reading list of any serious expat to uh, read World War II. That's the same message there. Thank you. Um, 
And he loves that book so much, so much. He's, he's posted that three times. Um, a book I recommend, another book here for the reading list. Uh, people um, should read Lisbon, War in the Shadows of the City of Light. Uh, of course, yes, yeah, City of Light, Lisbon, 1939 to 1945. Thank you for that, Joel. You've been remarkably restrained with your uh, political sharing this morning, but I haven't scrolled down that far yet. Uh, preamble to Constitution. The Constituent Assembly affirms the Portuguese people's decision to defend national independence, guarantee citizens' fundamental rights, establish, and it goes on. And that's why I think Doc loves um, the politics here so much, or aspects of it anyway, or the basis of it. Good morning from a foggy Malvera. The 2015 legislative elections provided a shock result with a relative majority obtained by the right-wing coalition, actually celebrating their win and preparing to rule, being defeated by an unprecedented union of the remaining centre and left parties. Thank you very much for that, Marco. Oh, and this is the bit we were missed from um, what Andy was sharing, establish a socialist state. Um, and I guess, you know, I guess, were you saying there that it's it, that's not so much a political statement, more of an aspirational um, sociological statement to be socialistic rather than socialist, possibly? Yes. Portugal was not a people's republic. That's what I meant. <laughs> Okay, that's 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 simply put. Did you want to share something on the screen, Miguel? I haven't I haven't got it at this end. Yes, uh, just on the topic of books, I would say perhaps the most relevant and most famous book uh, of Portuguese of Portugal during the war is Casino Royale. Of course, it is. Of course, it is, and it has not gone unnoticed that you would make quite an interesting character in a Bond film yourself. I don't know if you saw that, um, but. Why. Um, well, look, uh, can you please ask Miguel to say, come, come, Mr. Bond. You derive <laughs> much pleasure from killing as I do. Um, maybe we can get you to do, to do that towards the end. I don't know. But you make a really interesting connection there with Casino Royal and Ian Fleming, of course, being in, um, in, in, in Portugal in the Second World War, as I understand it. Um, in Estoril, absolutely, and his um, that famous character Tricycle, the Russian, the Russian spy, I think, who was called Tricycle because he was always with two girls. Uh, interestingly, okay. um, I don't know if that's an urban myth. Probably is, but um, a good a good question from um, the Indigo Escape. Um, how usually are uh, the president and and the prime minister from different parties? Is that the dynamic? Are they usually from opposite parties or different Very parties? Frequently, yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, this is a fantastic conversation. Uh, conversation. Thanks, Sue. I'm really enjoying the education this morning. Um, yes, but only if he has enough compelling arguments to to make an early vote. Um, that's that's. Uh, we need a bit of context with that one. Um, so, so the constitution lays out an intention to establish a socialist society. Andy, not letting it lie there. Um, and enjoying this a great deal uh, with his, his uh, social socialist and socialistic values from Portugal. What a shake! So the first declaration of a, a directive here, I think, from a Portuguese person, Sekeresh uh, Muda. What what does that mean, Sekeresh Muda? If, if you want change, vote. If you want change, Shega. Okay, we will. Obviously, we can't have a political discussion here without mentioning uh, Shega. Um, ah, so it just happened organically this time. I'm under the impression they are currently from two different parties. Um, yeah. Yes, that's true. Um, yes, he does. It's what we usually call the atomic bomb. Is that the atomic bomb as in the two from being from different sides, I wonder? Um, we are at the moment reading a book recommended to us called The First Global Village, How Portugal Changed the World by Martin Page. This is great. So many excellent resources this morning. Um, feel free, please, Miguel, to share on the screen if there was something else you wanted there. Um, and your and yes, you, your your comment. I found this fascinating. Uh, Jose Socrates, um, an engineer with a degree taken on a Sunday when all the universities are closed. All right. But let's say he is an engineer. Um, lawyers and engineers. I mean, that's such a fascinating combination and, in, and, and an insight into the psyche of politics in, in Portugal in its own way, I think. Um, beyond the EU, where are Portugal's alliances and or influences? Excellent uh, question um, to, to, to address as well. Um, and lots of comments coming in. So, Miguel, did you want to share something on the screen there? Yeah. So... Look this is an, an interesting um, image, which shows the, the first image is the uh, so this is uh, the results of the last presidential election. Um, the first image is the candidate that was the most that received the most votes. So overwhelmingly, the current president won in every district of, of Portugal. Wow. Now, the interesting pictures are the other two, which is the second most voted candidate. 
And there we have a, a, a significant change. Um, uh, so the system is, is um, upended because uh, the little pink color is in the districts where the Socialist Party candidate uh, won. That would be normal. Um, Marcelo is um, formally the candidate of, the, of PSD, the, the center-right party. Uh, but the dark blue color is the candidate from Shiga, from that Enough party, which is one of the new parties that, that made it into parliament in 2019. Mm. Um, so that is a big, big change. Absolutely. And, uh, because Not only because th th that party exists, but uh, in the space of one year, it managed to um, basically um, gather votes from a considerable part of the population. In, in the, the, the last presidential elections, this new party that we're discussing uh, gathered uh, about half a million votes. So for a party which is one year old, that's incredible. That's significant. Mm -hmm. And so I have here an image of the new parties, um, and perhaps we can discuss those. Please, yeah, absolutely. So the uh, socialists are on the left, so followed by the Social Democrats, that's uh, the, the ones we knew until now. Then we have Shiga, the Enough Party. Um, they came in at um, um, third place in the presidential elections. The left bloc we already know. Then we have the Liberal Initiative, also a new party. Um, Pan, People, Animals and Nature, was elected back in 2015, but they're still in Parliament now. And okay. then on the very far right is the uh, Free Party, or Livre, which is also a, a far-left party, uh, basically um, uh, a secession from the left bloc. Um, so we have now uh, nine parties in Parliament where there used to be five. So things are changing very, very quickly. Um, Shiga is basically a conservative party. Uh, and this is new because until now, the right wing did not dare to be openly conservative or at least openly anti-socialist, put it that way. Yeah. Um, they, they, they prefer to disguise themselves a bit as, you know, center-right, centrist. Uh, Shiga is unabashedly right wing conservative. Uh, the liberal initiative I mean, I would say they're rather centrist because uh, they, they have very radical um, privatization proposals for the economy. But on the other hand, their social values are very similar to those of the left bloc. Um, uh, so it's, it's a, an odd mix. Uh, People, Animals and Nature is basically an, an environmentalist party. And Livre is an alternative to the left bloc. It, it has a complicated history. I'm not sure it's worthwhile going into that. but. Um, um, uh, well, they're not, they only have one MP. They used to have one MP. Now they're they're, they're split. Anyway, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> okay, so so we've gone from five to nine, uh, and this can make things harder work in politics. Obviously, the more parties there are, it splits the vote, and then the traditional parties have an easier job in many ways, don't they? With what's left, um, I have so many questions, but, but so do other people as well. And this is a good point, I think, to ask this one from from Victoria: Are the Portuguese politicians bringing the people what they want? So we look at that spread of nine parties. There, you would think so, wouldn't you? In other words, are they representing their constituents well? How would you answer that? I mean, you know, what are levels of satisfaction and what's your personal view on that? Um, historically speaking, they are the very lowest that they've been in decades. Um, people don't trust politicians. They don't trust uh, the political system. Um, you know, cafe conversations um, invariably revolve around calling politicians corrupt. Um, so, no, I think I would say trust in the political system is at an all-time low, and I think in, partly that's why you see all these new parties being elected. Okay, and, and, and in a sense, it's it's to try and to try and build, um, I was going to use that, politi that dreaded political phrase, build back confidence. Um, I mean, there's another thing we might talk about, you know, the, the, the sort of global agenda of, of, of um, the Great Reset and where Portugal might fit into that, which um, to me is a little chilling. But anyway, somebody may, may wish to bring that up. But um, here we have what would looks like greater representation, yet uh, faith and belief and, and trust in governments at an all-time low. 
So you've given us a historical analysis. We're in in the in the, we're up to date now. Here we 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 you know I've I've articulated what I think is going on. You know, in terms of um, still smarting from the from austerity and and a worse economic um, situation to come. How are you seeing? the future in terms of how the political parties are positioning so themselves at the moment and based on your his historical understanding of Portuguese politics. And I know it's punditry and I know it's crystal ball stuff, but there's, there's probably nobody better than you and, and, and some of the people gathered here to, to make a call on that, Miguel, if you, if you wouldn't mind. So the, the image that we were seeing now is of a poll um, that was conducted after the presidential elections. And we see here the most voted parties in that poll. Um, Socialist Party and PSD traditionally being the larger parties, they're still there. Um, uh, Chega is the, the big news because it's a very, very new, very conservative party and they're in third place in that poll. Um, following the left bloc, you have the Liberal Initiative, again, very much in favor of privatization. Um, and I, I would just like to provide the, the context, the justification of why things are the way they are. Please. Uh, the truth was that the PSD leadership um, following the controversial uh, Socrates years, um, did not really was not seen by the right wing voters to provide much of an alternative, um, and, and much of, a, of an opposition to uh, the socialists. Um, and so, basically, um, when the current leader of PSD was elected, um, many people just left the party. They they couldn't stomach supporting PSD anymore. And so the liberals went and formed the liberal initiative, conservatives formed Chega, and that's how you have these two very strong parties, because normally PSD would be a, a bit more of a rival to PS, but at this point they, they're falling behind. And it's mostly because of these um, secessions, uh, let's say. Um, the, the free party, or the, the very smallest party, is I think basically, in my opinion, um, there because the left bloc supports the, the socialists. Mm -hmm. um, and the left bloc used to be the, 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 the center of the protest vote on the left. But since they support the government anyway, then the protest vote has to go somewhere and it's going towards Livre. Well, it, it did in the last election. We'll see how it turns out in the, in the next one. Um, where do I see things going? I, I'm not sure because the, whereas it's true that these small parties are growing, um, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, depending on how you look at it, um, the growth is incremental. So I don't know that they will be strong enough in the next elections to remove the socialists from power. But one of the few changes that they have managed to operate was in the Azores. You know, the Azores and Madeira are, um, uh, autonomous regions, so they have uh, certain powers. They have uh, regional parliaments as well, uh, very small ones, but uh, they're there. And the socialists ruled the Azores for decades uh, alone. Um, that bred a whole, you know, brought them uh, many allegations of corruption. Um, but uh, well, people kept voting for them. And now, for the first time, because of these new right wing parties, they were able to. <laughs> create a, a sort of a contraption of their own in the Azores. So even though Shega and the Liberal Initiative are not part of the regional government, uh, PSD and CDS rule uh, Azores um, with their regional parliamentary support. So things are starting to change. I don't know if they will change considering the next election, but they're starting to change. Mm. And of course, one of the um, uh, mysteries that remains is what will happen to PS. Uh, and PSD to a certain extent, but PSD, we see that their uh, voters are changing things. With PS, it's a bit of a mystery because in the rest of Europe, uh, socialist parties are not doing very well. In, in France, they, they've, they've suffered considerably. In Greece, they cease to exist. Um, in Portugal, it's still the strongest party. So the question remains for how long? Mm. Fascinating commentary, Miguel. Thank you. I would echo that. Absolutely. Uh, and I hope we can continue to talk for a little bit more. Um, we, we have a, a, an excellent attention span in our in our community here of Good Morning Portugal on expatsportugal.com. Um, the debate is lost within with capitalism. Uh, look at the debt levels in the USA. Um, on, on one level, I get you. Uh, Doc, and you know, any any Marxist would say that, wouldn't they? That, you know, look at the state that, that, that these these capitalist countries are in. But 
people still seem to have um, quite quite a faith or they're on a treadmill with it anyway. So uh, whilst the de debate may be lost, the everyday reality of capitalism seems to trundle on just fine. Um, when did the contraption begin is a question from Mark. It is interesting that Portugal's fiscal policy has diverged uh, or has diverged from much of the West, but has been successful in relative terms. Yeah, I mean, there, there, it has its own unique way of doing um, the, the the general theme of Western democracy and politics, doesn't it? So, when did the tr the contraption begin? Two thousand fifteen. That was that was two thousand and fifteen when it started. Okay, um, and what? Why could you say more about this? Uh, the Portuguese take or flavour on. I mean, let's face it. The, 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 we, we, all of the all of the all of the states of the EU are, are various sort of neoliberal enterprises, aren't they? Trying trying to do capitalism in their best way and and be socially democratic and kick things down the street. You know, the the full on um, results of, of of the previous austerity. What's coming with the pandemic? Um, what's happening with debt levels? Um, that's that's usually given to future governments, isn't it? Rather than sorted out by the government in in place at any time. So there's that. that mm -hmm. Those time bombs are ticking away, all of them. Um, but what's Portugal's unique take on that? Is it, it would you characterise it as the contraption? Uh, well, I can describe the contraption. I, I don't. <laughs> the unique take is only political. It's not. It's not financial. Financial. It's in the same situation as the other countries. It's worse. I mean, um, uh, until until this year, until. Uh, a month or two ago, Portugal was, it was in the top 10 of the world's most indebted economies. So uh, it, it's a disaster zone, but because it keeps getting bailed out by the EU, um, it, it goes on. But um, no, it's not doing well at all. Uh, as for the contraption, um, I, I think it has to do with the fact that we had a, a very, very left-wing uh, flavored revolution. And so many people, um, I think that most people, most citizens in most countries don't particularly care about politics. Um, they only do when they really have to. Yes. And in the revolution, everyone had to. So their political education was the revolution. So for many people in Portugal, especially the baby boomers, um, their, their political values are left wing simply out of context. Um, and so the austerity measures, I think, were a shock to many people because the government's basic job, in their eyes, is to provide people with, with stuff. It's to provide them with social security and healthcare and education. And so if there are cuts to those sectors, and in some cases unprecedented cuts, then that's outrageous. That's, that, that's shocking. Um, and I think it, is, it was this outrage that was also driven a great deal by, by the intellectual class and by academia and by politicians by journalists that um, basically imposed um, the contraption. Uh, I think on, on the part of the left bloc, um, especially and the communists, there was a bit of a rhetorical entrapment because they had they had argued so much, they had used such a, a, an hysterical rhetoric against the austerity the governments of the right that they really couldn't possibly justify not supporting the socialists when they were finally given the opportunity to um, um, revert the, the, the policies of the austerity governments. So um, th they couldn't back down at that point. And in part, it is that fear, that, that rhetorical entrapment that still drives them. Um, because the truth is, uh, the communists and the left bloc have been losing votes. Um, the and, and this is this is um, um, critical in some aspects. Say, for example, in presidential elections, um, you need to get a certain percentage of the votes in order for the state to pay for the campaign to subsidize the campaign. Below a certain threshold, you don't get any money. Uh, and this has happened to both the communists and now with the left bloc in, in these past elections. That they, they they really are very very much on the verge. They run the risk of not getting any funding. From the presidential election so they run candidates and these candidates do extremely badly and it's not a coincidence it's partly the effect of marcelo marcelo is supposedly a right-wing leader but honestly he, he he rules as a as a as if he were a ps president in my view uh, but it's also partly the fact that there is no distinction between the left bloc and the communist party relatively to the ps because they support their budgets you know one of the things that the the right uh mocks is that the left bloc in the morning goes to parliament to vote the uh, the uh, socialist party budget 
in the afternoon it comes out to the streets to, to, to demonstrate against that budget. It's, it, it, it's completely hypocritical. And of course, this, you know, has effects. Incredible, incredible. I, I, I think that's so fascinating, Miguel, about the baby boomers being of the left in Portugal, because I think elsewhere in the world, the baby boomers have done extremely well from neoliberalism and capitalism. You know, most notably their, their, their personal assets, their house has gone up in massively in value. They've all become, you know, little capitalists, haven't they? And they've enjoyed that sense, you know, because that speaks to people. But to, to, to think and know that the Portuguese had their political education from the revolution in our fairly recent history is, is really inspiring. I, mean, I, was, I was getting, you know, chills when you were talking about that, that there may be a, a socialistic consciousness among the older generation here because of, because of that sudden education they had from the revolution. That's absolutely fascinating. I think that's another thing that makes Portugal a little bit different. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Chagra, if we, if we might. Uh, and and you know, I think the gist you were making in this answer is your earlier question, I think, Gary, about the influence of the left. And how generally speaking, you know, we are political, and not political systems, but politics itself is in this slow creep to the right, isn't it? You know, centre to right. And that's what works for the EU. That's what, that's what, that seems to be the steady creep. Certainly, you know, my experience of the UK is that's what's happening. You don't recognise the left anymore because it's moved so far to the centre and gone over that line that, it, you know, it's, it's social democracy with a right with a right lean on it that's what that's what the left has become in in, in a popular sense um and hence then um the the um openness and desperation or whatever you might characterize the rise of shager enough change you know these these these, these, these political movements come out don't they when people feel understandably frustrated it tends to give birth to this sort of political i'm going to call it a political outburst um is Gary right in thinking that Shega have a more national, just nationalistic agenda? Could you tell us more? Could you answer that and tell us more about Shega and you, and and, you, and its popularity and its ongoing popularity here in Portugal and its influence in the mix? Yes. Um, so I, I, I think they have a more nationalistic agenda. I think the problem is that uh, <laughs> are they nationalistic? Yes. Um, I think the problem is that other parties are becoming less nationalistic and that leads people who are patriotic to feel um, in the first moment confused and the second moment outraged. Uh, I will show you some of the things that, that drive the, the Shega vote um, and uh, well, the, the right wing uh, vote in, in alternative parties in general. Um, we, we spoke of the contraption. Um, part, part of the reason is the fact that uh, PS behaved very poorly in, in, in these few years and they didn't suffer any consequences from that. In fact, they're being rewarded because they, they keep ruling, they keep forming governments. And, you know, in Portugal, we, there is much talk in the media of a, um, um, a cordon sanitaire, a, uh, um, a, a wall, a dam to, to keep uh, Shega out, the, 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 fasc the fascistic populace. Um, but th there is no stigma associated with PS, which had a very corrupt prime minister, which bankrupt the country, which um, and, 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 you know, the, the, that broke tradition and formed the contraption. Um, and this had all sorts of implications. So for example, the the parliament in Portugal is called the Assembly of the Republic, and the Assembly has a president, just someone to um, um, moderate uh, the debate in, in in Parliament, and that person was traditionally uh, chosen uh, amongst the uh, the, more, the bigger parties, uh, and it was traditionally someone who was not controversial, precisely because they had to moderate between everyone in Parliament, so they had to be someone who was fairly consensual. Mm. But the current president of the assembly is someone who is incredibly um, divisive, um, who is very um, rude. He was uh, caught in, in a few decades ago uh, uh, um, in, a, in a secret uh, recording, uh, uh, basically saying that whoever messes with PS, uh, you know, um, gets hit. Uh, they're very arrogant, very divisive. And this is the person that that PS chooses to represent them and and to and to uh, preside over over parliament. They've been doing things. And the problem is, 
if we could say, well, you know, PS has good politicians and bad politicians. Yes, Socrates was a bad politician, but now everything's different. No, it's the same people that used to be in the Socrates government that are, that are there. The people who defended him when, when yes. he was arrested. They're there. Yes. I mean, uh, Kashta was Socrates number two. Um, and, and this so, matters to, matter to everyday people, doesn't it? They don't forget stuff like that. No. And quite frankly, I, think, I can tell you this much. I think it matters to a right-wing electorate at least. I yes. don't know what, what centrists and left-wing people think, but at the very least, for the right-wing, this is, this is egregious. How, how can this yeah. be? Um, yeah. And so I'll, I'll share some, some more um, images of, uh, I, I would say, problems that the right uh, views with the system at the moment. Yes. Um, we'll go from there. Uh, so, um, so you see, um, the, the, this is one of the problems that uh, we, we had recently the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party and you had communist flags uh, all over the country. Um, you could never even dream of having anything remotely uh, like this for any right-wing uh, party. I mean, this is incredible. The, the, in the European Parliament, for example, they have votes in which they condemn communism and fascism. And in, in Portugal, the the parliament led by PS refuses to um, to endorse those votes. So they do not condemn communism. They have no problems condemning fascism, of course, but not communism. So this is one of the things that incenses the right. Yes. Uh, here are articles of when Socrates was uh, arrested. Uh, he's still on trial, by the way. And uh, people's guess at the moment is that he will walk because the, the um, uh, statute of limitations will eventually expire. And, you know, he's been tried, he's been tried, he's been tried, but, you know, they never get around to have the trial. Uh, and so eventually it will expire and he will walk. That's what people uh, suspect will happen. That would appear to be the um, the corruption playbook, though, right? We're seeing that's we're not the only country seeing that here. Uh, long trial, uh, keep kicking it down the street. Maybe people will forget. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's I, I, at least that's what people on the right suspect is happening. I'm not going to you know uh, <laughs> say one one way or the other, but that's what uh, the, that's the impression they get. Yeah. And here we have a number of uh, headlines of things that I, I think are just. Uh, you know, uh, outraging the right. Uh, I, I'm sorry they're all in Portuguese, but I'll, I will try and... Uh, and uh, I need to apologize. We get yeah, a sense. Mm. So um, you, you're saying that Chega is nationalistic. So why is Chega perceived as nationalistic? You, you have um, this image of a statue on the right. There's also a statue here on the, in the middle on the left. And these are statues that have been vandalized. There are other monuments that have been vandalized by left-wing uh, activists. Uh, because basically they look at Portuguese history, you know, traditionally seen, you know, Portuguese are very proud of their history, uh, but they vandalize these uh, statues of historical figures uh, because they were all colonialist and racist and uh, yeah. so on and so forth. And I think this is very, at the very least, disconcerting for the right. <laughs> um, you have um, this little man on top um, in, in parliament, he uh, um, defends, he advocates for the demolition of the Monument of the Discoveries in Lisbon. Again, uh, because history is problematic. Um, on the, um, on the, still on top, you have the mayor of Lisbon. Uh, he uh, advocates for the uh, banning of Chega as a political party. So he doesn't want, uh, he, he thinks that Chega is beyond the pale. Um, on below him, we have this lady from uh, this influential NGO who's always being interviewed, and she says that racism does not exist uh, from blacks to whites. It's only whites who can be racist. Um, on on the left, um, we have this news report of a conference in Nova University, who was which was basically uh, censored. Uh, it was a right wing conference uh, with right-wing um, uh, intellectuals and the because of pressure from the students union i believe um the the conference was cancelled um pure and simple below that we have one of the members of government of the costa government saying that they want to monitor uh, hate speech on the internet of course hate speech means basically right-wing speech and below is one of the recent news um these honor 
uh, honor uh, students, uh, you know, some of the best students in that in a certain school, they they were not allowed to um, um, move on. Uh, so past past the year, I'm not sure how to put that in English, um, uh, because the their parents refused to allow them in uh, what we say are um, citizenship. Uh, a lesson, citizenship. citizenship uh, oh, yes, course. yes, yes. So, uh, civic education, I'm not sure how you, but, but the problem is that in civic education, of course, they have a, 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 a certain amount of um, now, these days, uh, left wing ideological um, values being taught. And so, many conservative parents are not particularly fond of that. And actually, until Recently, I don't know how it is now, but these these um, these courses were not mandatory. So um, I don't know if they are now. But uh, the socialist uh, deputy minister for education was trying to um, sign uh, an order to to flunk them, to to prevent them from um, moving on in in school. And so um, there was a big outrage. I think they were eventually allowed to. To proceed, but just the fact that a government minister would would, would uh, deputy minister would, would do this uh, would interfere directly with the school and and for ideological reasons is is, is un, unprecedented. But um, so these are some of the things that incense the right, and mm. uh, because PSD doesn't seem to do much or be particularly concerned about these things, uh, parties like Shega are growing. Yeah, and you say parties like I mean, so they're not alone. There are there are other right wing parties that or, or, or Shiga right was um, Shiga had a number of advantages. One is that its leader used to be a pundit, uh, sports pundit, but still he was on TV. He was known, um, yeah. so that that brought with it recognition. And mm. the other advantage is that they were some of the first to. Uh, oh, and he was, he used to be in PSC himself. So he he uh, many most of the members of most of the people who vote and who uh, are members of Shiga. Um, and disclaimer, I am a member of Shega. Right. But um, so so I, I don't want people to think that I'm completely unbiased. Um, but most of the members of Shega come from PSD and CDS. They come from from the right. And so they had a certain already they had a certain experience in politics, in, in Portuguese politics already. Um, that was the advantage. Now, there are many other right wing movements that are trying to uh, become parties, but of course, it's always very difficult to get the, um, the signatures and the funding. And so um, they're not parties yet. Wow. OK. Um, and, and I feel I uh, thank you for your, your authenticity, your transparency and openness there. I didn't ask you what your political views were before. And, you know, I, I think it's fascinating. And I, I have this immediate sort of journalistic. I, don't, I actually don't see myself as a journalist, but I have this immediate journalistic. Oh, I need to get someone else on another time to balance up the extreme Miguel Silva from Shega. Uh, and, you know, I say that uh, tongue in cheek because. These these are emotional political times, aren't they? You 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 are saying you 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 have some support for what you know is characterised as, as as an extreme party, and I don't suppose you would deny that extreme people are attracted to Shaker, um, but you can't yes. help that with political. You can't help that with a political party. Now, um, I, I'm in, you know somebody we we've, I've had a man to man with here, and, and other people have, have been um, talking with you and, and learning a lot about politics, and you, you're you're an extremely um, sort of learned and, and educated person in politics, you know, my, my immediate reception, my, 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 my immediate question or reaction is like, you know, what's, what's a smart guy like you doing in Shager? And I, again, I don't mean that in a bad, you know, you see what I'm getting at here. It's characterized in, in a way that is, that fits this whole sort of uh, narrative of outrage, one side to the other extremism mm -hmm. and so on. C c I want to ask you that man to man. You know, so what is it that appeals to you about Shaga? And 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 that's coming from my woo, a little bit of surprise. Um, and 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 also not very understanding, as I said right from the get-go here, not understanding uh, Portuguese politics very well. So so what is it for you personally then that, that attracts you to Shaga? Um well you know, uh, I think that the the mainstream media narrative is often does not often correspond to reality. So um, you know, Shagistin is basically a, a crypto fascist party. Um, again, most of its members came from PSD and CDS. These were not, you know, extreme parties by any measure. Um, and actually, I think they did a 
poll or a study of some kind uh, last year and then basically found that there were, proportionately speaking, more people with uh, higher education degrees in Shega than in, in the bigger parties. So, um, it, it, and uh, listen, uh, I'll give you a practical example. CDS uh, used to be seen, not sure now, as the elite party because many of its members were, uh, they, you know, they lived in Kashkais uh, and Sintra and they had properties in Alentejo and, you know, they were seen as, oh, the rich people's party. Well, guess what? Many of these people came to Shea. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not exactly a, a party of the rabble. Um, it, it is very popular. It's very popular in rural regions as well. This is true. Um, but by no means it is, is it a, a, only a working man's party. There are plenty of uh, uh, educated people and um, people with means um, in, in the party as well. Absolutely. There, there would be no question about that. And, and we do have to be careful, don't we, of the uh, sort of tabloid um, characterization of anything. Uh, especially uh, p political parties. So um, we, 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 th th this has been an interesting plot twist for me. Uh, this interview must be made to a left-wing analyst because he, despite being polite, is misrepresenting many aspects of Portuguese policy. I mean, uh, Paula, bring it on. Um, M Miguel uh, Silva here has been, has been kind enough to step forward and give us an amazing introduction more generally to Portuguese politics and culture. So I'm so glad you've done that today, Miguel. And, you know, we have an open platform here, so I'm entirely open to what... Pa uh, Paolo there might characterise as, as a more left-wing anal analyst of politics. But I, I, to me, it seems to me like you've given a, an objective view of politics and you've been transparent and, and told me where your uh, political colours are nailed. It might be interesting to have you and the doc on here um, talking at some point because, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of Marmite subject on the one hand, you know, oh, no, they're talking about politics on Good Morning Portugal show. You know, it's better when they talk about food and Portuguese wine. <laughs> and maybe it is. But I think these the, these um, grown up, leisurely, respectful conversations are extremely important as well. And I really thank you for for, for stepping forward and, and, be, and being honest about your uh, political persuasions as well. And this sums up for me, you know, what we're about. If you ban or forbid political views parties, then you have taken a step closer to the dictatorship that you oppose. So um, as uncomfortable as it might be at times, I do think we, we should have these um, um conversations and, and invitations to people. Uh, Mark says, uh, this has been a fascinating presentation and discussion. So, so much still to learn about Portugal as a newbie uh, living in Portugal. Uh, just with a few concluding comments now, I followed the case of the boys who are going to fail because they did not attend citizenship classes and what Miguel said is false. So uh, clearly that lends itself to a more, or a matter of opinion certainly, but it lends itself to a more of a panel discussion and again, I say, bring it on. Let's 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 have that those debates. It's so important in these politically charged and emotional times that we continue to talk without a doubt and don't dismiss or cut each other off. So I, I stand for that absolutely, uh, Michael Hopkins. So I think expressed a, a, an unwillingness to engage with NGOs. I think the nationalist patriotism and love of the country has been replaced with the label right wing. Um, interesting comment, Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Uh, it, Miguel, it's, it's interesting for certain. I'd love to hear more, even though I'm far left. Being far left in the US, um, it's not difficult, is it? <laughs> Just yeah, to even associate, to talk about socialism at all, I imagine makes you far left in some parts of the, the United States. Uh, it's all part of culture, says Sue as well. So, on, on that note, I, I do thank you um, for being here, Miguel, with your excellent analysis of, of Portuguese history, setting the scene for us. And um, yeah, as, as what we got to towards the end there, um, contemporary politics, where we go from here. Uh, when I said the, um, when I mentioned the Great Reset earlier on, you gave a knowing nod. Um, you're, you're seeing that as part of the political future and context as, as we're moving forward from the pandemic? Um, it depends on what you mean by it. Um, uh, people on the right in Portugal, I can tell you, are, are very concerned and very skeptical of uh, the term. Uh, but it seems to be taken as very natural and very um, organic by by the mainstream media. Uh, it depends on what it means. I, I think, uh, from, from a conservative standpoint, if you are now going to have such things as um, COVID passports in order to access whichever, traveling, uh, public services, etc. Uh, that's very concerning and, in my personal view, unjustified. And um, so it, it, it really does depend. Um, 
it's um, it, it is very subjective. It's not very well defined. The Great Reset, is it? No, but it, but, but 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 with all of these things, it's co-opted to political leaning, isn't it? So uh, for, if you're a, if you're a sort of neoliberal centrist, it just seems like a fairly obvious thing to do to to build back better and 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 to have a collective globalized future that's good for all people. And 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 in in, in, in a, th through certain optics, which is the word of the moment, isn't it? Um, that that could be seen as yes, you know, we're all sort of you know one global village, happy people. Let's let, let's be socialistic in that sense and and create one great big. Um, friendly supportive world and 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 you who wouldn't on the face of it want that who who wouldn't want a united world where, where there's where there's a equity uh equality and people being nice to each other that's not a difficult sell is it but then when you get into the long grass of that and you understand the agendas behind it i also understand why the right are deeply um against such new economic forum um globalist and to a certain extent the agendas of the eu in, in this regard. So uh, to me, that's that. Th this is one of the great limitations of the political debate. Positioning ourselves on the political spectrum tends to cause people to deny parts of themselves. This, this is what I'm seeing going on at the moment. So you, you, that's why I'd love to see you and, and, and Andy Thompson from our community here uh, have a discussion here. Because you would, on many things you would agree in, human in a humanitarian way, but you would entirely disagree in a political way, i.e. the means to, to bring those humanitarian aims about. And I guess that is what <laughs> politics is about. And that's why it continues to churn in, in the way it does. But yeah, um, amazing, amazing today. A, um, sorry, go there on. was a famous uh, Friedman, uh, Friedman quote where he said that the, the tragedy of politics is people uh, interpret politics based on intentions and not on results. Um, and so obviously it, it all sounds good, but does it all produce good uh, is, is the uh, important question, I think. I, I, I find myself agreeing with you. I saw a meme um, only yesterday, um, which is, you know, uh, along the lines of how's that working out for you? Because I think that's a, that's a difficult but excellent question. How is that working out for you, for our, our personal lives and our political lives? But it's like, you know, are you a good advert of the things you believe in? Um, because on the one hand, I think we need to do that personally. And then uh, when you scale that up politically, uh, is is what we've got, is how we're relating to each other. Are people being cared for? You know, that is the advert for the beliefs that lie at the heart of any political system um and clearly we haven't got it quite right at the moment and that's why we need to keep talking i think in in the way that we are so i i thank you very much for being here this morning um can you re can you recommend a left-wing analyst my pleasure um a left-wing <laughs> analyst who would um have a conversation in english i'll have to think about it i'll come back All to right. you on that. Okay, maybe we speak to them and then maybe we speak to you both at some point in the future. But again, let me say, and on behalf of this community, thank you for stepping forward into our need to understand uh, Portuguese politics better. You've done a great job um, and uh, look forward to staying in touch and and, and, and hearing more. And uh, yes, your recommendation to, uh, you know, maybe sort of politically, intellectually balance things up a little bit as well. Miguel, thank you so much. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity, Carl.